Uh, welcome to our webinar today on ensuring commodity crops using whole farm revenue protection um, for producers. And I'm going to be starting off by doing a few introductions. Um, so my name is Anna Johnson, and I am a policy associate at the Center for Rural Affairs. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and we advocate for healthy rural communities. We're based in Nebraska, but we work nationally. And healthy, small, and mid-sized farms are a key component of rural communities, and access to good risk management strategies is an important part of farm viability. So today, we're really excited to be holding um, one, of, one in a series of webinars on the crop insurance program Whole Farm Revenue Protection, which is designed for diversified operations. Today's webinars are aimed at commodity operations, and our upcoming webinars will be focused on livestock operations, and those will be on December 14th. So today we are going to hear from two experts on whole farm revenue protection. Scott Marlowe is the executive director of the Rural Advancement Foundation International, a North Carolina-based nonprofit organization. And Cliff Parker previously served in USDA's Risk Management Agency, which is the arm of USDA that administers crop insurance. Um, he is the assistant deputy administrator for insurance services. Um, and Cliff now works as an independent risk management consultant. And we are so excited they are here to share all of their expertise and wisdom with us. Um, so we have an hour for our webinar, and um, Scott and Cliff are each going to present, and then we will have about 20 minutes at the end for questions. So a couple logistical things. Um, please feel free to um, enter in your questions into the question box in your webinar window, um, and we will um, address them at the end. And um, and also, I wanted to just let everybody know that we are recording this webinar, um, so and we'll be posting it later on YouTube so that you can review it um, and then also share it with other folks who are interested. So um, I think that is it. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Scott. Thank you very much. Um, um, give me one second here. There we go. Um, my name is Scott Marlowe. I am with the Rural Advancement Foundation International, as Anna said. Um, we work all the way from on-the-ground direct help to individual farmers around both uh, financial counseling, we, um, we have a financial crisis hotline, um, but also the development of new farm enterprises, all the way through to national and international policy work. And out of our work with individual farmers really came this focus on crop insurance and especially the whole farm revenue crop insurance policy. Um, I'm really excited that we're doing this today for commodities producers because I think that this is, um, this is a market for this policy that is really untapped. And I, I think that commodity producers, it's an important, important moment for commodity producers to consider how this could be a part of their risk management portfolio. So just to go over a few basics on crop insurance, and, and what we're going to do is I'm going to go over some of the basics of crop insurance for, you know, and, and in a commodities group, usually people are pretty familiar with it, but I'm just going to go over some of that and the basis of um, whole farm revenue. And then I'm going to hand it over to Cliff, and he's going to get into the nitty-gritty de details and all of the stuff that, you know, the, the real specific stuff, and then we'll, you know, we can answer questions over a little bit of time. So why is this, why are we talking about whole farm revenue crop insurance and why is it important? Well, first of all, in terms of crop insurance, this is really the primary way that government covers um, production losses and disasters. It used to be that they would pass bills that would cover production losses, but really um, as it, they've really uh, shifted that to focusing in on crop insurance. Um, and, and we don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, crop insurance also is very important in terms of lending. It really drives how your relationship with your banker and, and can change how an operating loan is collateralized. And as we have all experienced, I think, they're, they're, we're facing a lot of um, changing weather patterns and, and more extreme weather patterns. And so this type of uh, crop insurance is very important for, um, for farm viability over time. Um, the way we talk about it frequently is, you know, disasters are not if but when. So um, while a commodity producer may have multiple options for crop insurance, frequently, um, frequently they may have some other kind of um, specialty income, income from specialty markets or other crops on the farm that's not covered. So uh, you know, a corn or a soy farmer may be selling into a seed market or into a specialty market of another kind. Um, for a while, I worked on soybeans that were bread for a tofu market, for, for making tofu in Japan. These are obviously much higher value 
than the regular commodity price. And so there may be that um, uninsured income that's left over after the, the general crop, in, um, crop, crop insurance policies. Um, and they may have other uh, on-farm enterprises. They may be doing something um, to, they may be doing something else to bring income in that doesn't have a specific uh, crop insurance policy. Um, so whole farm revenue crop insurance policy, it does a series of things that regular multi parallel crop insurance doesn't do. First of all, it incentivizes diversification. The more diversified you are, the better the deal is. Um, it recognizes a proven farmer price. So if you can show that you've been making, you know, if, if you know, whether it's corn or soy or something else, if you can show that you've been getting a higher price than the regular commodity prices over time, you can insure at that price. Um, and it allows for insurance for things that previously were not insured. Just to go back over some of the real basic stuff about crop insurance, um, crop insurance is a public-private partnership. That means the government has a role and the private insurance companies have a role. The USDA defines the policies, so they set out how, you know, what the policy will cover and what it costs and all kinds of other things, how it will be, be implemented. It provides a subsidy of the premium for the farmer, and for whole farm revenue, that's as much as 80% of the of the premium, which is a very, very good deal. That means that if you had to get this coverage out on the marketplace, you would be paying basically five times as much as what you are actually paying. The the third thing is that, so then the the it, the USDA also pays companies directly for administration of it, so that also reduces the cost based on the premium. And it has a share of if there are truly catastrophic losses over a certain level, USDA picks up a portion of that. Um, on the other hand, what the private companies do, they are actually who sells the insurance to the farmer. So while a farmer may go to the insurance company to buy the, the, the policy, that policy is being um, subsidized and determined by USDA. Um, the company has to provide all of the policies available in that area. So they can't pick and choose which of the um, crop insurance policies they produce or, or they offer. So they all have to offer this policy as well. Um, and they have to obviously follow all of the guidelines and the policies that come from USDA. So any kind of insurance policy um, any kind of insurance policy has five basic pieces. And um, those are what is, what is being insured, um, what is the, oh, one second. I'm sorry. Um, what, is the, um, what is the being insured, what is, what is the value of that, how is, and before loss, um, what is an eligible loss, what, what, what can be covered, and how will the value after that loss is determined and then what's the percentage of the difference that will be paid? Um, in general, multi parallel crop insurance, this is the you know, normal stuff. The, the unit is the crop within a farm. And that value is determined either by the, by the farmer's actual production history, which is then valued at the current market price, or an actual revenue history. Um, or sometimes, and, and that's the price that the farmer has a history of over time, or there can be an independent number, um, like a county average. Um, losses are generally what is outside of a person's control. If your land is flooded by a hurricane, you're covered. But if you screw up and break a hole in the dam of your irrigation pond and flood your land, that's on you. So it's, it's things that are out of your control, usually um, uh, weather and, and things like that. Um, losses are generally determined by an adjuster who comes out and inspects the field, and then different policies have different coverage levels from a catastrophic level, which is 55%, up to about 80%. Um, on the other hand, whole farm revenue does this very differently. So what it ensures is the annual gross of the whole revenue, of the whole farm. I'm sorry, the annual gross revenue from the whole farm. Um, and that is determined by a five-year average of the Schedule F as filed in the farmer or the farm's taxes. Um, for beginning farmers, that can be reduced to three years if they're just starting out. The loss is determined by the Schedule F of the insured year. So this is important in that if there is a loss in a calendar year, you're not going to get paid for it until you, after you file your Schedule F the following year. So there can be a delay in actually getting paid on the loss. Um, and the rate of coverage is up to 85% of that five-year average income. 
So how do we determine when it's right to do whole farm versus regular multi peril crop insurance? Um, whole farm is great for diverse operations who have significant income from crops that, that are other than the wholesale price. And so if it can, that can be commodities that are selling into a specialty market, that can be other products that are being produced on the farm, um, you know, from whatever source. It covers crops that don't have specific crop insurance policies, so if you're producing something that, that is not covered. Um, when available, um, because of the way the risk analysis works, the, the multi parallel crop insurance will pretty much always be more cost effective in terms of the coverage, it's, it's almost always. And so, um, but, but that multi parallel coverage can be nested within a whole farm revenue policy, and we'll get more into the details on that later, so that you have the multi parallel um, covering a piece of that revenue and then the whole farm revenue covering the rest. Um, and this is really important when we're talking about um, commodities producers, this is very important because they're generally going to have some kind of crop insurance on the larger scale commodities. So if a farmer produces a range of commodity crops but has significant income from an alternative market or other things, um, they can get their multi peril for corn or soybeans and then cover the rest of the income with whole farm revenue. Um, I'll give a quick uh, example of how this works. So let's say Anna has a history of producing $100,000 each from corn and soy, and this is gross, not net, um, $50,000 from direct market grass-fed beef, and $50,000 from a specialty wheat that, that she grows directly for a local miller. Her average revenue is $300,000. With diversification, that coverage is at the 85 percent level, 85 percent of that $300,000 history, that's $255,000. So the target that she would have to get to before a loss would be $255,000. Um, but if she's able to take out crop insurance on both the corn and the soybeans, the remaining insurable income for whole farm revenue is 85% of the $100,000 or $85,000. Losses on soybeans or corn are covered by the multi peril policy. If she loses half of the income and, and the payments, basically what would happen is in setting that initial um, whole farm revenue, any payments that were made on the multi peril on the multi peril insurance policies would go against that income. So you you would that would just basically count towards that income. Um, if she loses half the income on the beef and half on wheat, that income is uh, you know fifty thousand dollars. And, and so that 85,000 minus 50 is, it would be uh, an indemnity of 35,000. But in that same scenario, if she were to make an extra $20,000 each on the corn and soy, so you have an increased income on the other ones, then that moves back above the loss threshold and there's no payment. So, so, the, um, so the, within the whole farm revenue, that multi peril crop insurance policy um, the, the payments that come in from that policy become a part of the revenue that comes in for the whole farm. Some of the main points from our experience in working with this are that the, the application process for whole farm revenue can be much more complicated than regular multi peril crop insurance, so it's really important not to wait until the last minute. Um, you need to do your best to find an agent who really is knowledgeable about the policy. Um, it, it covers min the minimal processing needed to bring a crop to market. So if, if you have to you know, put it in a bag or um, clean it before it comes to market, that can be covered, but not if it's adding value, if something is adding value. Like you know, in this case, it's like a, a, a chopped salad or something like that, but it would be something like milling for flour or, or something else that actually really is a change. Um, one of the things that's important here is the growth factor, and, and Cliff is going to go a little more deeply in terms of how the growth factor, because in that five-year history, there's a growth factor that allows the income to grow over time, and so that you can go beyond that five-year history um, very specifically. But it's really important to understand that, because if the operation grows past that level, that added income will still count towards the whole farm revenue. And so you're effectively reducing the level of coverage. Um, so to sort of sum up, we feel like this is, um, you know, our experience with this is that it's a, a tool that we're really only starting to be able to understand how it can be used in a wide range of opportunities. Um, Certainly, the main the, the the main users of the of whole farm have been smaller scale and and highly diversified, usually fruit and vegetable, but other um, crop farmers. Um, 
but we're seeing a real emerging market on this for commodities producers who are bringing other income, income that's not covered by regular multi-barrel into, um, into the farm. And it, this is a way of really increasing their risk management capacity. Um, so thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it over to Cliff now, and he's going to go through some of the specifics of the policies and, and, and go through um, more of the detail. So Anne, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. That was great. Okay. Cliff, are you ready? Yeah, let me bring my... I think we did. Okay, so you got all that. So I, was grow I grew up on a small diversified farm. We grew a lot of commodity crops, but we also, as Scott was saying earlier, we also grew some crops that were not conventionally insured. Well, back in them days, there was a lot of crops not insured. I quit actually farming actively in 1988. And so a lot of crops uh, were not insured, but uh, we did have that mix of crops. Okay, now, to get right back into what the whole farm covers, um, it covers animals, animal byproducts, and it covers all commodities produced on the farm, excluding your timber, forest products, and animals for sport and stuff like that. It will even cover if you have a few specialty items over here and you run a roadside stand, but you also buy a few products, pumpkins and watermelons or something extra, up to 50%, that can be okay. You can't have over 50% uh, resale because we're not, it's a crop insurance program, it's not a resale insurance program. Now the coverage levels. Are we, everybody hear me okay now, Anna? Yep, still got you. Okay. The coverage levels are between 50 and 85%. Um, and as you can see on my screen here, you have to have at least three commodities if you go to the 80 and 85% level. So if you have one or two commodities, you can qualify for this crop, but you just can't buy past the 75% level coverage. Um, so, so basically, Almost anybody's growing can qualify, unless there's a few exclusions we'll get to in a minute. Historic revenues adjusted for uh, farm expansion. There's an automatic indexing process. Um, if your average is, say, a million dollars for five years, and if, if any one of those last two years is bigger than the average, the computer will automatically index your, uh, your average, now um, your revenue average. Now, you can opt out of that, but I've never seen anybody do it. There's really, I don't understand a lot of opponents for doing that, but you can opt out of the index if you want to. Um, expanding operations, let's say you've had 100 acres of corn. Historically, in this year, you go to 125. That's 25% increase. You can petition your agent and company, and they can actually go above your average by up to 35%. Uh, the cost for market readiness, this is not so much corn, soybeans, cotton, those crops. Uh, where this comes in play is some of your, uh, some of more of your specialty crops where people do things to enhance the price of them for market. We do not do that um, added value stuff and all that. It's, what we're insuring is a commodity as it is. It, now we will get it. We will include the cost of getting it ready to market. You know, um, as we say, on farm or in field and things like that cost, but not no added value. Like if you're making wine from grapes, we'll cover the cost, we'll cover the grapes, but not the wine, that part. Other federal crop insurance policies covering individual commodities may be purchased, but you have to buy those. Let's say you're a corn, wheat, watermelon, cantaloupe grower. You can buy insurance on your corn and wheat, but you have to buy it at a buy-up level. Another thing to keep in mind, if you have crops that are not insurable, um, you can buy NAP. Now there is some different, there is some uh, stipulations there on the NAP, but you can buy NAP. If you buy crop insurance on your other programs, remember you've got to buy at least buy up coverage. You cannot buy the catastrophic, which is 50% of your average at 55% of the price. And uh, any, if you buy other policies and you get an indemnity on those policies, that is considered revenue in your revenue stream. Okay. All farm revenue is insured under one policy. This is one thing that I talk to some farmers that are commodity farmers. They're sort of tired of having six policies if they're growing six crops. They're saying, look, what we want is a basic coverage out here that will protect us in case of a catastrophic event. We're not looking for little spot losses. We're looking for a policy that will set a flow under us. 
got a million dollar annual revenue, and we'll guarantee you $750,000. That's what they're looking for. This policy is a perfect match for that. And it's a lot less expensive than buying individual coverage on individual policies because you get that diversification factor in there. If you've got farms with two or more commodities, um, you get a whole farm subsidy, which is really good. I think uh, Scott told you then, subsidize 80%. That, that is beyond good. That's great is what that is. Uh, farms with one commodity still get a good subsidy. It's not quite as much. I'm going to show it to you right now. If you'll look up on your screen, you'll see uh, if you've got only one commodity, corn's your only crop, then you would not qualify for this product if corn's your only crop. And the reason I'm telling you that is because corn has a revenue product. If you only grow one crop and that crop currently has a revenue product, like corn, you would not qualify for a whole farm. It's one of the one things that would knock you out. If you farm corn and soybeans, that's okay. Even though they both have revenue products, if you've got two or more commodities, you can still buy this whole farm. So if you've got one commodity and it's a commodity such as tobacco or um, watermelons, just one, and, and there's no revenue, they could be a crop insurance program, but there's no revenue, you can qualify for this program up to 75% and it be subsidized 55%. Let, now, once you go to two or more commodities, this is when this product gets really affordable and it's what it's really designed for. The subsidy is 80%. Now, as you increase your number of commodities, the premium rates lowered also because of a diversification factor. So up to seven crops, this product keeps getting least less expensive, less expensive right on down, and then on top of that you get 80% subsidy. As you're starting to see, this product can be very affordable. Um, and where is it available? That is very easy. I can do that with my eyes closed. It's offered everywhere. Every county in the United States, this product's available. Um, first crop insurance, like that. Most of our crops are offered some places, not others. Now, a lot of people say, is this too good to be true? There's got to be some exclusions. Yes, there is some exclusions. There's several of them. What I'm going to tell you about is if you've got one crop, and that crop has a revenue program already, such as corn, soybeans, cotton, you can't buy this product. You've got two crops, yes. That's one. Another exclusion is if you are over $17 million. If your average revenue is over $17 million, you can't qualify because the policy maximum limit is $8.5 million, and you have to buy at least a 50% level. Okay, another, there's two more exclusions, three more actually I'm going to tell you about. There's another one that's a million dollars in expected revenue from animal, animal products. You can't go over a million dollars. You've got 999000 you're good. Same with nursery. If you've got greenhouse or nursery over a million dollars, you cannot qualify for the product. Floriculture, floriculture, cut flowers, is not considered greenhouse and nursery in our eyes for this exclusion. There is one other exclusion, and this could be, might be considered a commodity crop in some people's eyes, is potatoes. Not sweet potatoes now, but potatoes. If you have potatoes, and that's your only crop, you cannot buy whole farm because years ago, the National Potato Growers Council did not want revenue coverage on potatoes, so that's still in the law. So those are the exclusions. Other than those exclusions, I will pretty much say almost everybody qualifies for this product. What's it well suited for? It's well suited, in my opinion, for almost all farmers. If you're highly diverse like this, it's, it really works good for you. Farms are specialty commodities, uh, farm selling direct markets. And the reason we say it's well suited for those and commodities are not specifically listed is because, I mean, your major commodities like corn, wheat, soybeans. The reason we say that is because they do not have the revenue products that's already currently available on those specialty crops on those commodity crops. Not that this product don't work just as good for you as a commodity grower as it does for a watermelon grower. It's that these people growing these specific crops did not have the coverage that we've currently had and past had on these products. But it works just as good for you in my opinion. Um, available to all farms and ranches that qualify, we've talked about the limitations for qualification. Uh, WRP, insured revenue, is the lower of. Now how do you get that guarantee? I'm going to tell you real simple. Call your accountant and tell your accountant 
to give you your gross income for products raised on your farm. It's either line 4A or line 2A off of your Schedule F, and look at it 15, 14, 13, 12, and 11. That is five years. Take those numbers, divide it by five. Okay, write that number down. Okay, you got that. Then you go back and you write down what you plan to grow next year and then put down what an acre of that commodity is worth. Now, you've got to be able to prove that. So you've got to have APH records. If it's a commodity crop like corn soybeans, if you don't have records, we'll use the T yield in the county, which is the county average, basically, and we'll use the price that RMA come up with. So we'll do, we'll come up with something, we'll come up with that. We'll take those two numbers, those five-year average, let's say that's a million dollars, then we'll look at what you plan to grow this year, and what you plan to grow, you expect to get 1.1 million, then you get the lesser of those two. So your guarantee will be based on the million. And then, as we said before, we'll guarantee you 50 to 75 percent of that. Now, now that's real simple version of it. If you've grown, if you're growing, as I said before, that can be added on top of that. If your last two years are higher than the average, that can be indexed. So the thing to keep in mind, what I told you is a real simple version. You can it can actually be better than that. Uh, does diversification on the farm matter? Yes, it does. I've told you up to seven crops. You can keep on getting lower and lower premium rates as the diversification comes up. Uh, does diversification on my farm matter for WRP? As I said, yes, it does. Greatly. This product is wonderful for people with two or more commodities. If you've got two or more, that's where the, really the benefit comes. And then if you want the 80 and 85 percent level, you need three commodities or more. Um, this slide here has, uh, has the potato farms must have two commodities. I've already I've already given you uh, that exclusion. Uh, I've already talked about this slide. Um, I've did so many presentations on this product, and I've worked to help develop this product. Me and Scott have put a lot of time and effort into this product. And I've been working on developing this product from way back when it was a predecessor was, was uh, AGR that sometimes I get ahead of the slides because I know this product probably as good as any product that we have out there. And so when I get to talking, sometimes I've already covered a lot of the slides up front. Uh, whole farm revenue covers revenue produced in that crop year. So in that insurance year or crop year, what I'm saying there is if you have, if you have commodities that are in storage that you grow this year, we've got to appraise those. And what we're going to do is appraise how much is out there. Say you've got a bin of corn and there's 200 bushels in it. We're going to see what that price of corn is at the end of the insurance period, which is December 31st for calendar year filers. And if Chicago Board of Trade at that point is $2.10, we're going to value that corn at 1,000 bushels of $2.10, and we're going to call that inventory. If you sold products, if you sold a load of corn to uh, Cargill or any other, Conway Ag or anybody, you sold them. 200 bushels, but you haven't got the check yet, that's going to count also because that was produced in that year. Now, some farmers get concerned. They say, well, you're going to count against me again next year. No. Next year, it will not be included in next year's revenue because it was produced that year before. Um, okay, what's covered? Now, we've talked about this product. We talked about it going to insure you $750,000 for a million-dollar farmer. Uh, what's covered? Uh, if this is what's really good about this policy natural cause of loss and decline in market price during the insurance period. We're talking about almost to the edge of anything that's outside of your control. That's what it comes down to. If the price drops, now I didn't say everything out of control, I said pretty close. This is about as inclusive of policy as you can buy for anything. I ain't just talking about crop insurance. This is probably about as inclusive. If you go out and buy a car, there's always some exclusions and everything. But this product covers all your natural losses, droughts, floods, hurricanes. It covers if disease comes in and takes over your crop and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, if you just decide I don't spray for that disease, that's not covered. But if you try your best but you still don't make a crop, it's covered. The price drops for some reason. Uh, the price corn goes to a dollar a bushel, you're covered. Um, Taxes must be filed for the insurance year before claims made. That is one of the things that probably, one of the major things people don't like. You've got to do your taxes because that's what we do is we take that 
revenue that's reported on that Schedule F, that's what's used because that's what your guarantee is based off of. When revenue to count for the insurance year is lower than insurance revenue, a payment's made. That's pretty simple. We guarantee you $750,000. You go out, you take care of your crop all year. Hurricane Matthew comes along, lowers your yields. You have another crop over there. You got cotton. The price drops to $0.40 cent on cotton for some reason. Put it all together. At the end of the year, when you file your taxes, it's seven hundred. You bring in five hundred thousand that year. We guarantee you seven hundred fifty. You get a check for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I, to me, that is the best form of crop insurance there is on the market. Okay, uh, what information required for you as a farmer? I'm gonna tell you this is no more complex, and even probably not as complex some of our other products. You can call your accountant and tell them to email you five years of your Schedule F. Ninety percent of the people listen to this listen to this webinar today could call their accountant right now and say, "Email me five years of my Schedule F," and they can do it. Uh, a lot of farmers email it straight to the agent. They tell their accountant, "Talk to my agent," and the agent they talk with the farmer never even sees the Schedule F. You need the Schedule Fs. You need supporting records. If you are selling your products for more than the going market price. You need to show records of that so you can get increased price to do your operations report. Uh, so that's what you need. You need your APH, your records of price, and you need your five-year average, something that all farmers pretty much have. Now, what you'll do up front of February 28th in our area on the southeast, some areas is January 31st, some areas is March 15th. You need to talk with an agent and find out your sales closing date in your area. By that sales closing date, you have to put in an intended acreage report. That's what I told you earlier. You intend to plant. Then you got to put in an acreage report later in the year of what you really planted. And then by the next sales closing of January 31st, February 28th, or March 15th, you got to do a production or a final form report. Okay, we've already talked about the sales closing dates. Um, now, this is really important too. You don't have to pay for this product the day you buy it. February 28th, March 15th, whenever you buy the product, you go ahead and sign up. You have until August 15th. You won't even get a bill to August 15th. You get a bill on August 15th of that year. So it's for 17, August 15th, 17. Then you've got 30 days to pay the premium. Just make sure if you buy the product, you pay the premium by the next sales closing. Because if you're not, you'll lose rights to buy crop insurance or any USDA benefits for a year. So that's something that, that's, that's really important there. Now, this is a real good product, but it's absolutely useless if you don't know where to go get it at. You know, it could be the best thing on earth, but if you don't know where to get it, make sure you take a snapshot. If you've got a, if you've got a phone in your hand, take a picture of this slide. You have to buy this through a crop insurance agent, and you can go on RMA's website and it'll tell you exactly what agents are licensed in the area, but I'll go a step further. When you go into your farm service agency office, ask them to show you a list. They have a list of all the agents that are in your area. They are not legally allowed to tell you which agents to go to. So they can't tell you, well, I prefer Johnny or George over here, but they can give you a list of the agents that's qualified. So I hope that gives you a really good overview of the whole farm policy between me and Scott both. Um, we've got pretty good knowledge of how this works. So. Uh, I guess, Anna, we'll entertain any questions anybody has. Great. Thank you so much, Cliff. This is great. OK. Um, so we, we have a couple questions from participants. Um, one of them is, um, this participant says, if I have dual purpose wheat, winter wheat that is grazed with calves, and I rotate occasionally with summer crops like milo or a hay crop like Sudan, how would this work for me? I currently can't ensure double crop summer crops in my location. Here's, here's what you got to understand about whole farm. You can do whatever as far as grazing, double crop, those type things. That's not, that's not a real big issue. The issue is we're insuring money on your Schedule F. So if you're grazing hay, that's not showing up on your Schedule F. It's showing up in your cows. So, and the way, the, the way it works on cows is we insure the year that you expect to sell them. So if you've got an average of $200,000 is what you've been bringing in on your Schedule F for your cows, for any hay you sold, and all that. Next year, you project to bring in 250. 
and you've got that record showing you know that you've got those cows and you expect to sell them in 16 months. That's what you do. We don't really, when people keep talking about grazing and hayland, we don't actually cover under whole farm hayland as far as that. It's because you have a loss on your hay, we don't pay you a claim. I hope you understand. I hope I'm getting across this. This is a revenue product, and it's based on money that's recorded on that Schedule F. Great. Great. And um, the person who asked the question, please feel free to follow up with additional questions. Um, Anna? Yeah, Anna. If I could throw one other thing in, and those kinds of grazing issues, uh, you know, frequently in droughts or other places, we see real loss of grazing capacity. There, there is a program. There's a separate disaster program called the Livestock Forage Program through the Farm Service Agency that does address those losses in those pasture losses and the losses of forage um, for folks who are grazing cattle. So that might be something else if there are if if the person. Um, has had losses due to a disaster, that might be a different place to look for covering that, that part of their loss. Yes, it would. And let me reiterate uh, one other thing, too. There's a lot of opportunity for people with grazing and hayland. Now, we've got another product that I consider to be one of the new innovative products of crop insurance. It's called Pasture, Rangeland, and Forage. So anybody that's on this webinar, if you'll go to RMA's website, and search for PRF, Pasture Rangeland Forage, and it works, and I don't spend a lot of time on it because it's a whole farm, but what it does is we have put grids in all over the United States, and so everybody has a grid on their farm, and that grid, we've gone from 1948 to today, and we've established how much rainfall, the average rainfall is on that land, and let's say, and you've got to buy at least two two-month increments, and if you don't get the rainfall that your normal average is, you get a check in the mail to help pay for your offset of your buying hay and all that. If you're in the hay business, that is a product you need to look at. Great. Thanks, Cliff. Um, we've got another question. Uh, one of the participants asked about whether there's any communication with FSA that um, the participants need to need to be aware of or be tracking. Yes, the first place all farmers need to go is FSA. I want to make that statement real quick because FSA has a lot of products, just as Scott said, and I could go through a list of products that are out there, from tree assistance program to livestock assistance program to ELAP to NAP program to the TAP program. Their ARC program, PLC, FSA has an array of products that farmers need to go in and talk to about, and most of them are free to farmers because that's what we set it up for, to try to keep folks farming. Okay, now, yes, uh, when you go into FSA, it's really good to know your acres and have them reported because if you tell us on a whole farm you've got 100 acres of uh, watermelons and you've got them reported at FSA, that's even better because we can track it. The two agencies talk together, their, their databases share, so it is nice if we go in on RMA and see that you report 100 acres. There is the only requirement under whole farm that you go to FSA, the only requirement is you have a conservation plan. For any USDA benefit, you have got to go into our FSA and do it AD 1026. That is a conservation plan because we want to make sure we take care of our lands so we're sustainable for years and years to come. Awesome, thank you. Um, I've got one more question uh, from a participant who's asking, where do we go to get a list of the crops that qualify for this protection? And they're wondering if Ms. Campus qualifies. I want to make this clear. I don't know of a crop that don't qualify for this, hardly. Any crop pretty much will qualify as long as it's a revenue producing crop. They're talking about probably giant miscanthus, which I don't know what they're doing with it. They might be using it for biofuels or whatever. If, if it's showing up in their revenue stream, it's pretty much covered without exclusion. If you've got one crop as potatoes, no, it's not covered because that's the law. If you've got one commodity crop, it's corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton, and they have a revenue program. You're only growing one crop. That's not qualified. But other than that, now the list. I think it'd be easier for you to call me 
and ask me, and you're and you're welcome to through you know through the channels. You can go through Anna and find and get my number or whatever. And you're welcome to call me. It's easier for me to tell you a crop's not covered than it is to tell you what is covered, because everything's pretty much covered. Awesome. Um, so the participant replies, um, it sounds like this is a good product for someone who is somewhat non-traditional and no-till and rotated in an area that is, um, this, this person rotates in an area that is almost 100% conventionally tilled and um, rotate where most ground is fallow for part of the year and cattle is a big part of the operation. So this product would ensure all of those income streams from farming and would not disqualify them from livestock feed assistance. Feed assistance, is that correct? Yes. If that we will ensure their revenue stream. That's exactly right. That's what this product is. It works in line to ensure their revenue stream. And they can uh, you know the other things you're talking about they're feed assistance and all that. No, this would not dis that would not disqualify from this product. Um, but Cliff, those payments do become part of the income for this policy. So That's if you get exactly any federal right. payments, any disaster payments or anything like that, that becomes part of the gross income. Um, just like nesting a multi-parallel a multi crop insurance policy within Whole Farm, any kind of payment you get on federal programs becomes part of that gross income. Scott, you're 100 percent right. If you if I guarantee you seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and you get twenty thousand through livestock assistance, and you get crop insurance on another commodity for four hundred for forty thousand, that is part of your revenue or uh, revenue to count against your whole farm. Yes, because we're guaranteeing you're going to bring home seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And, and to, to follow through on that, though, those payments don't become a part of the average income. So that in the case that you talked about where someone had a 700, if the, the coverage was $750,000, it's $750,000 in an anticipated income. They brought in 60 of that out of other, other programs, a disaster program or a crop insurance program. That would drop that income. That, that 60000 does not count as revenue when they're doing the next year, when they're doing that five-year average. So, so that's a place where it can be a challenge. That's correct. I've got a couple of questions that, um, that I was wondering if I could ask you and you can talk about. Does that sound OK? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. OK. OK. Let me pull them up. Um, so you mentioned that, um, that farmers should be starting to get ready early to apply for this policy. Can you talk a little bit more about what information they need to be gathering on their end and, um, and, and what sort of you know, advanced prep they should do before they go talk to an insurance agent? Sure. So obviously, um, when, when you go in to talk about this, you need to have together, if you're, if you're setting up that, um, that average over time, you have to have the Schedule Fs for the last five years. Um, actually, usually also um, the, the, the due dates uh, vary between states, but it's January, January through March. Uh, March 15th, I think, is the last one. So sometimes people haven't done their taxes on the previous year. So sometimes you're really talking six years back. So getting together all of the Schedule Fs and making sure that that's together is, is one of the first important things, and that will determine the average income. The second part of it is, okay, so what are you planning on doing together? Do, I mean, sorry, doing the, the next year, this following year. And so laying out what, um, you know, how many acres of what, what you expect to make, laying out what the different income is, um, is, you know, the, sort of the second part that you need to go in with when you're going in to talk to the agent. Um, it's important to get somebody who, you know, there are a few people who have done a lot of this, or if, and, and the more... Um, the more of a learning curve there is, the earlier you need to go in. So um, it's, it's really helpful to go in and, and, and start talking to your agent pretty early. If there's someone, you know, the, the first year is generally more difficult because you're pulling more things together and getting it entered and all that kind of other stuff. When you get to a second year or a third year, it's much easier because then you're just downloading the stuff that you've already got in the system and, and can, you know, you're just adding the next year, adding different parts of it. So, so generally what the process is is that you'll have 
Um, you, you establish what that five-year history is based on your Schedule Fs. You establish your plan for what you're going to do, what you're going to actually do that year, and, and you have that laid out and what, you know, what your anticipated income is. You know, obviously, you have to be able to show that you're going to bring in the income that will match that, match or beat that, um, the, the five-year average. And then as you get into the system, you have to go in and say, oh, okay, well, this is what, you know, there's a, a period where you can adjust that based on, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you didn't get the corn in the ground, so you've got extra acreage of soy or, or whatever that is. Um, and so, um, you know, you have to go back in and meet with your agent uh, later on down the line to establish what it is that you actually have produced, what it is that you're, you're actually going with. So, um, you know, on this, because of the diversification, because there can be a lot of different crops, it can be fairly complicated. It also, you know, if you're only at three or four things, it can be not that complicated. So um, working through the process is good. It's always a learning curve the first time. Um, and just being in communication with the person that you work with on crop insurance is important. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we're still having trouble getting Cliff back. I think he's um, working on his internet connection. Um, so, but, um, but Scott, I was wondering, um, I don't think you went over yet, I don't think we've gone over yet today what the different deadlines are for applying for this program. Um, and I know that they vary by location. Can you talk a little bit about, um, about, the, about those deadlines and, and what you know about how they vary? Um, yeah, the last deadline is generally March 15th. It's different if you're renewing versus doing a new one. Um, they'll start in, in January. The, the best way to look at it is um, the Risk Management Agency has a website um, rma.usda.gov, and within that website, they all have um, connections. They have both an agent locator and also have um, fact sheets about the policy that will lay out some of those deadlines. Um, and so that you know, that's a that's a pretty easy thing to pick up as you're going. Awesome, awesome. And I'm I'm hoping to send around some of those links when we do a follow up. Um, sure follow-up email from the webinar. Okay, um, let's see. And so that, um, now I know that, I know that there's some insurance agents who are really experienced with this product in certain areas of the country, but, um, but it's, it, there's a little bit of a learning curve in other areas of the country where it's not as widely used yet. Um, do you have any advice about like questions that people should bring in when they go to see their insurance agent? Well, I think that it, um, asking if they're, you know, that first conversation with an agent is always really important. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, around the country, different people have had different experiences in terms of how open that agent is to, um, to that policy. So if it's, if it's a person that you've worked with over time, it's always good to, you know, to work with somebody that you know and, and going in and saying, you know, are you, are you, I, I want to look at this, um, you know, are you willing to work through it with me? Um, what you're looking for is somebody who's really willing to go through the learning curve with you. And you'll probably have to go, if it's, if it's not someplace where there is someone who is really experienced, um, then it, what you're looking for is someone who's willing to go through the learning curve with you and being able to, um, you know, being able to, to, to sort of figure it out together. Um, and you, um, that, like I said, that, that, that first time through can be, uh, can be difficult and be um, a, just a little bit more complicated. I mean, you know, first time through on anything, applying for any kind of program is, the first time through is, is a, can be a challenge. But um, so, you know, if you're in a part of the area where really very few of these are sold and some, in some geographic areas it's, it's less popular, um, just Talking to the insurance agents that you know and and seeing their openness to working through it with you and being able to figure it out um, is a, an important piece of the puzzle. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we have a question from um, from one of the participants. Um, Rigoberto asks, does the producer have to keep reporting the operation to FSA? Um, reporting on the operation to FSA. Um, I want to make sure I understand the question. Hold on. I'm juggling lots of different windows on my desktop. Um, and I think I, could you maybe clarify that? Can the participant who asked? Um, 
working on that. Um, and 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 I apologize. I had um, I wanted to be clear the the. The dates aren't just flowing. There are three dates, basically. It's January 31st, February 28th, or March 15th. And that's which of those three you have depends on, um, depends on where you are, basically. Um, there's specific gotcha. to counties. So those, those dates are either January 31st, February 28th, or March 15th. Okay. okay. And producers, oh, click. You're no, right. Great. Well, thank you both so much. I think we'll... Um, um, I don't see any other questions coming in, and so I think we'll wrap it up there. But thank you so much, Cliff, and thank you, Scott. This has been really wonderful. Thank you very much. Great having you. Great. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.